it's fun to be here. I'm really excited to, uh, to share some thoughts that I have on the future of trucking, particularly when it comes to sustainability. Uh, I'm not so sure, 10, 15 years ago, I would have thought I'd be standing and saying sustainability and trucking in the same words. I mean, you know, and, and we're gonna get into that a little bit here. And so um, I've got pretty thick skin so uh, I'm going to talk for about 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, and then uh, uh, we're going to do a Q&A. So uh, if you vehemently disagree with something I say, uh, if you nicely say that, then we'll have a good conversation. If you loved what I say, you know, say that as well. But um, my name is Mike Roth. I lead an organization that's been around for about 14 years called the North American Council for Freight Efficiency. So long name but it helps being long. So we focus in North America, US, Canada, and Mexico, and we work on freight efficiency. So we work on helping the industry, y'all, my wife is here with me. We've been in the South for, two, for about a month, um, South Carolina, North Carolina, New Orleans. So y'all is in my current vocabulary, but um, uh, you know, we're here to help you all do better, save money, uh, on operating trucks uh, in your fleets, um, help the people that are doing that, the truck builders and others to bring you better trucks. Uh, and also we're working on you know, what's coming with respect to this sustainability. So let's dive right in. Um, if you uh, are interested in some of the stuff, I've got some cards uh, up here. These are simply to uh, you know, look at our newsletter, do it once a month if you're interested in uh, anything. Everything we put out is free. Uh, and I think pretty good. So um, it's not like, you know, just because it's free, it's worthless. But um, there's the websites. Grab one of those cards as you walk out. So before I thought about talking about the future, I thought we'd go back. Um, anybody been in the trucking industry 40 years? Who was trucking in 1984 in any way, shape, or form? Ooh. I, I was just graduating college and starting my career, so... Um, you know, here we go. Back then, we had mechanical engines. We virtually had no electronics on these engines and on these trucks. And can you, you, know, you know what we're dealing with now. Cruise controls, cab overs dominated, and uh, you know, the truck stop had pay phones for a lot of the loads to be directed and telling the drivers where to go next. Pretty incredible when you just look back 40 years. Now, some would say 40 years is a hell of a long time. But let's look at 20 years. In 2004, we had the, the consent decree, um, which really brought on electronic engines. So what that, what that consent decree was, was the first like really big round of emissions, NOx and particulate matter, was hitting in 2004. That was brought back to October 2002, but that was the first big one, and we really struggled with that as an industry, as many of you know. EGR coolers, um, a lot of electronics, a lot of things that worked but didn't work. Uh, we also had high sulfur diesel fuel. We had conventional tractors. Um, this long and tall, which you see a number of them here, was the predominant on the highways. But now as you get out on the highway, you know, we have a lot more aerodynamics that was starting to emerge right around um, 2004. Another thing that I did, well, no smartphones. Uh, we had cell phones, uh, but we really didn't have those smartphones. Um, but the other thing in 2004 was that was when we also saw fuel prices go up. Before 2004, we were really at $1.50 diesel forever before. I mean, all the way back to the early 70s. This is when we started, and this is when I got interested in efficiency, working on fuel economy, and really uh, that brought on where we're at today. This is a Volvo truck that was announced about two months ago, and, um, you know, it's been 15 years since we had the real last emissions change. We got one coming in 2027 with another round of NOx, but 2010 was the last time we really saw that. Fuel economy is much better on these trucks. We tracked fuel economy on different model years of trucks, and you know it's been pretty steep improvement um, from you know the 5.6 MPG now up to you know there's places where in general freight. Um, got a buddy here that's doing 10 mile per gallon lifetime, right? Uh, there you go. So we're, you know, but basic truck fuel economy has improved a lot. Got computers all over the place. A few other things that's hitting trucking, um, hauls are shorter. 
And, um, you know, this whole COVID and post-COVID world is, is really different. We could bring up all kinds of others like ELDs and so forth. But um, what I'm going to do is, is move now into the future. And some would say, well, we've been through a lot, right, as an industry. We've been through a lot. So maybe it's time we just, you know, all that's behind us. Let's just settle in and get the goods there and do trucking. Well, I don't think so. I think we're going to have a lot coming forward. So I'm going to give you a little bit of insights. And then we'll have a, you know, kind of a robust Q&A about that. So we do a thing called Run on Less. This is uh, uh, one of our drivers that was in the run. She works for Meyer. And um, I think, you know, she feels what I think all of us are feeling is a lot is coming at us. There's a tidal wave of stuff coming at us. Uh, everything from alternative powertrains, autonomous trucks. I mentioned the 2027 Knox. I'm not going to read through all this, but, you know, there is a lot going on. And I think it's easy to wake up in the morning and going, holy Moses, how are we going to continue to do this great work of delivering the goods? We got all this stuff coming at us, right? And many of which um, not only affects the fleets, the fleet owners, the uh, drivers, maintenance people, but really the entire industry, whether they're into telematics, parts and service, dealers, or whatever. So what I would like to do over the next few minutes is just how this is kind of some of the ways I think about what's hitting us in the future, particularly around uh, sustainable trucking. Um, and so I'm going to look at it in three ways. I'm going to look at it in uh, automated, connected, and electric. And uh, some people call this ACE. Uh, I don't know, but um, I'm just going to look through it and offer up some ideas in each of those areas. But before I do that, you know, why should trucking be sustainable? Uh, and I said earlier, you know, I'm not sure I would have put those words together not too long ago. But I think what we're seeing, uh, it, you know, in, in all aspects of our lives is uh, the, a culture of, re, you know, recycling, renewables, uh, do more with less. And um, just be very, very good stewards of not only money, but of the environment. And, um, you know, that's really, you know, it, it, you know, I think we're all feeling that pressure right now. So let me get into some things. Connected. So just a couple years ago, we didn't have computers on these trucks. Now these trucks are in incredibly connected. They're kind of connected to the base, right? Um, you know, we got cameras in a lot of trucks. Those cameras, if there's a harsh braking event, boom. That video is sent to the, the fleet, um, you know, in case there's a, uh, an accident, they can help with, um, you know, protecting the driver of somebody else's fault. We've got connectivity to um, other vehicles uh, and on and on. I don't know where this is going to end. Um, you know, I, uh, my son keeps talking about AI and um, what's going to happen. Um, just recently, a uh, lady that works for me, she says, Mike, are you texting me? Uh, from a different phone number and I said no and there was a stream of text that sure sounded like me That wasn't me asking her to go to the store and buy some gift cards I bring that up because this whole connected world that we're in is wrought with tons of opportunities tons of risks um, But likely where we're headed right? I mean uh, back I said just a few minutes ago 40 years ago you were getting your loads by waiting in a lounge at a truck stop for a payphone. Uh, so we don't want that. So connectivity helped bring us the ability to route trucks, get more loads, and, and, and do the work that we're doing much better. But it comes with risks and things we got to watch out for. I'm going to spend the most time on that E of this ACE, and that's uh, electric. Uh, but I'm going to actually talk about powertrains in total because, uh, you know, a lot of discussion here about electric trucks, hydrogen trucks, all kinds of things. So I'm get, we, we've done a fair amount of work in this area with fleets, with the manufacturers, with utilities, et cetera. Um, we, do, we do a thing called run on less every two years. And so last year in uh, the summer through the fall, we went out and found um, 10 locations that have 291 electric trucks. So these are battery electric trucks, no engines. Um, you know, they're the E-Cascadias to the international uh, EMVs to uh, smaller vans like the 4D transits and so forth. So we went out and we did interviews. This is me interviewing with a videographer, uh, driver of the Tesla Semi that Pepsi has operating out in Sacramento, California. Uh, and on the left are some Schneider trucks uh, at an intermodal terminal in Southern California. 
And um, this particular intermodal uh, had about 80 diesel trucks operating in slip seat operations, supporting railroads and uh, railways and uh, uh, terminals, as well as warehouses. And they're now 100% electric. So they've, they've deployed 92 uh, eCascadias from Freightliner. These are about a 230 mile truck. But what they do with, in the ports is they just run around small areas, dropping a container, picking up a container, dropping a chassis and a container, and so forth. So because they stay close to home, when that electric semi-truck gets um, low on state of charge, they can just go back to the dealer or, or go back to the depot, this site here, jump out of that truck, the driver can jump into another truck, and they've been able to figure out their routing to do the same amount of work with 92 that they did with 80. Now it's more trucks, trucks are incredibly expensive, um, but I'm, I bring this up because they're, they're, they're making these electric trucks really work. I know you, this is a, a, you know, a really detailed slide, but just I want to describe how we're thinking about powertrains throughout the course of the next, you know, really 25 years. So, you know, today we've got um, diesel engines operating most all of these trucks, even the new ones predominantly. Uh, we have a few natural gas tractors that continue to be sold. Out here to the right, you know, in a future of 25 years from now, uh, some of you will still be in trucking, many of the rest of us won't. Um, but we do see a world where we've got electric trucks, hydrogen fuel cell trucks dominating North American trucking. And the reason I believe that is multiple reasons um, and why NACFI believes that. One is that uh, that drive for being more sustainable for the air and for the environment and for everything we're doing. I think secondly, these trucks have a, uh, they're, they're incredibly cool and, and great trucks. Drivers love them. We've, uh, you know, I showed that picture of interviewing drivers. We've interviewed now 45 electric truck drivers and uh, they absolutely love them. Now, they love them if they can make the same amount of money in a 230 mile truck that they could with a 500 mile truck. So, you know, there, there's, uh, that's really important um, and I get that. But in the short haul, day cab, very focused regional applications, these trucks are, are really good for them. So we see that as the future, um, and you can challenge me on that if you'd like. But between now and then, we think it's gonna be really messy. One, it's gonna be, and we call it the messy middle. You know, we're pretty, we're pretty direct and pragmatic at NACV. We don't come up with fancy words. So uh, it's gonna be messy going to electric trucks. It's gonna be messy figuring out if hydrogen will be a play there. But it'll also be messy in that we expect renewable fuels, renewable natural gas, renewable diesel, possibly hybrids in certain parts of the market where a hybrid might work. Um, there's a lot of talk about actually burning hydrogen in an engine. So, you know, in that case, uh, you know, if it can be done, and we, you know, we believe it can be done, Cummins is all over it, other companies are as well. Then you have a clean fuel with zero carbon out of the tailpipe, but it's still combustion. So you have certain amounts of other, of other contaminants. So what we think is going to happen is having diesel in all of our trucks is probably not going to be the case over the next 30 years. Ultimately, we're going to go to battery and, and, uh, and hydrogen, and uh, there'll be a lot of other things that will emerge. So big deal for trucking, we think, but um, likely going to happen. But we're not done with diesel. Um, we've been really close to the, what's, what's known as the DOE, Department of Energy, Super Truck Programs. They're now started Super Truck 3. They had Super Truck 1 in the early, it went from like 2010 to 2015 or 16. Super Truck 2 went from like 2016 to 2022. And uh, just recently, we spent a lot of time with these truck manufacturers, five of the six. And we, we really dug into what did they do with these trucks. These trucks are incredibly efficient somewhere in the 12, 15, 16 mile per gallon range. Um, and they've done incredible work uh, to deliver one truck and one trailer that's very efficient with a diesel engine. Um, now, what's interesting and I think real hopeful for the future is when they completed Super Truck 1, many of those technologies that they tested on one tractor and one trailer has ended up in their production models tweaking aerodynamics, different tires, different um, idle reduction systems, different cruise controls, you know, uh, where, where the, you know, the truck can speed up, slow down, and really work on being very efficient in its operation. 
So Super Truck 2 is doing the same thing. So we expect continued fuel economy as we're going through this powertrain messy middle. It's important to work on efficiency now, or even more important, because of the range challenges of these alternative fuels. So, you know, if you put on aerodynamics, tires, cruise control on a 230 mile electric truck, and you're able to get 10, 20, 30 percent more efficiency out of that truck, a 230 mile truck becomes a 250 mile, 280 mile, or whatever. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to mention before I quit, or before I forget it, is the Tesla Semi showed you, uh, damn thing worked pretty well. Um, it del sorry, my language, but it delivered um, 400 miles on a, on a, on a one charge. Um, so that's kind of, you know, not quite double, but significantly more uh, than some of the other trucks that are out there. Um, and that was fully loaded. So that was hauling um, beverages around Northern California for Pepsi. Uh, and they also had very fast charging, uh, near diesel fuel up charging. So they charge at 750 kilowatts and uh, they're able to get a full state of charge on a very big battery pack. Basically, Tesla's packed in battery packs from tire to tire, inside, outside, inside and both outside of the rails. And uh, with that fast charging, they were able to do 1,076 miles in 24 hours. I bring that up because, um, well, first of all, you can't buy Tesla semis yet, um, but they built a truck that can do that. And, um, and that means that we're not going to be limited to this 200, 230 that I mentioned. Um, we think with the, uh, uh, the powertrains uh, and all of this technology around efficiency, we're going to end up with long haul trucks that are very focused on, um, you know, saving fuel and being uh, very efficient in their electric operation for the long haul. We're going to have regional trucks that are going to be very focused on regional city trucks that are very focused on city. So expecting a truck to do all those jobs, we don't, we don't see happening too much. Finally, I want to talk about automation. Um, you know, we've been automating trucks forever, right? I mean, we, um, you know, power steering uh, was an automation. Uh, you know, automated manual transmissions is an automation. Uh, and so now we've got more highly automated trucks with the cruise controls, the uh, ADAS systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to predict where this is going to end up. You know, there's people talking about driverless trucks on certain segments, you know, maybe from exit to exit. So the, uh, you know, the, the, the cabless powertrain, you know, hauls a trailer to the exit, unloads it or drops it. And then some, you know, a driver uh, truck, day cab tractor most likely would come and grab that trailer and make the delivery. That makes some sense to me, and, is, and it actually is, is, is sort of this um, schematic where uh, the yellow would be, uh, the yellow tractor things would be a, uh, you know, a, a, an autonomous, no cab, you know, power only that hauls that trailer on the main highway and then it, it you know, it drops it at, a, at an exit and, and goes, uh, make, makes the delivery with a driver in a regional hall. You know, the, the, the fr a friend of mine did this work and, you know, years ago, actually, and, um, you know, one of the things he talked about is, you know, that driver job in that day cab regional is one where he stays close to home, he or she, and could be a real attractive job in this whole scenario. I don't know if this is going to happen. I wouldn't even uh, uh, really take a, take a, a shot at it, uh, but it's interesting, and um, uh, we'll, see where, we'll see where automation goes. So with that, I'm going to kind of conclude it and then open it up for any questions. I promised you I'd take any. Um, so what do you do? Uh, you know, here, here, here's kind of what I think about that. So I do think the future is coming fast. Um, you know, I get accused all the time. What the hell happened to you, Mike? You were a diesel trucking guy and you're here talking about battery electric trucks. Where'd we lose you? I get told all the time, right? Well, I think it's because I've seen all the benefits of them and, um, you know, how, how practical they can be, uh, if we work on cost and weight and a few other things. But I do think the future's coming fast, so sticking your head in the sand is probably not a good strategy. Before you really figure all this out, though, I think we need to know our business really well. So know how your trucks are being operated, if you operate trucks as a fleet. If you're a manufacturer, you know, figure out how you, what products are you supplying, how does that fit into things, but really understand your business today. Stay up to date on what's coming. Attend things like this. Thanks for coming. I think, um, you know, learn about what's out there. 
uh, because, uh, you know, it's likely going to impact you. Ask others like you. So whatever your trucking part is in trucking, you know, find somebody else like you. Some would say, well, that's a competitor. Why would I talk to a competitor? Well, you know, maybe it's, you know, whatever they're doing, keep your eye on them. Copy them if you think it'll help your business. Of course, always think about cost, total cost of mine, total cost of ownership. And then finally, um, you know, I'm pretty sure it may not be the next truck you drive, but soon it's going to be a lot different than the one you're driving today. So with that, um, I'm going to stop and uh, thank you for your time, but um, I'll take any questions. Yes, sir. Can you get, you got a microphone? I'd appreciate it. I, my hearing's not great. <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, don't lose your... With the, electric, with the electric trucks, how much does it change your payload with the extra weight of the battery? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. So um, right now we have uh, eCascadia's from Freightliner. We've got Volvo VNR, or VN, VNR Electrics. Um, you know, we have BYD, uh, is a China manufacturer. We've got uh, Nikola and some others. Um, generally speaking, the... the um, the efficiency of these electric trucks is about two kilowatt hour per mile. So that's kind of the MPG equivalent, two kilowatt hour per mile. So wherever you read, if they've got like uh, uh, a 500 kilowatt hour battery pack, divide it by two, and that's your range. Um, so uh, today we have uh, about a 250 to 300 mile range truck. Now you gotta be careful. If you're really heavy going up mountains, it's gonna be less. If you're really flat and light, um, uh, what we're seeing with drivers is uh, drivers are worried about getting home. So they're very conscientious about driving. Uh, they're taking advantage of the regenerative braking. There's a new term that I kind of like called single, single pedal driving. So most of these trucks will stop without ever touching the brake, particularly in like medium duty box trucks where you're around the city, you know, you can be very easy on the, on the pedal and get a lot more range. Um, so. Uh, your question was really about weight. So for a 250 mile truck, we're looking at around six, 7,000 pound weight penalty. There's a 2,000 pound federal exemption already. So we're at 82,000 pounds. Um, so if this is, you know, if you go out heavy, diminishing returns, you know, bulk tankers, those sort of things, and this really isn't for you likely because you're losing revenue with the weight but, uh, you know, anywhere else where weight's not, uh, you know, a challenge as long as you're under that five, six, seven thousand. Now, one of the things that I get asked all the time is, well, I usually haul light, but every once in a while there's that one load that, that's heavy and I don't want to not get that load. Um, so we got work to do there. And it might be more on the end of, you know, I don't want to say, you know, these trucks can't deliver heavy, but it's going to be on the end of you may have to turn down those loads if, 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 it, if the electric truck makes sense for all the other reasons. Exactly. So I would say, you know, I, uh, um, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be like today where if you've got a real heavy load, you got to make sure that, um, you know, and the person accepting that load is, is saying, you know, I got a 15,000 pound truck and, or I got a whatever. So, uh, you know, absolutely. This, this will, um, well, let me say it this way. Those super truck programs that I was talking about, they did a lot of weight reduction stuff. And I was like, why are you working on weight? You know, I mean, we got, you know, we truck's a truck. But um, now with these heavier powertrains, with these alternatives, and particularly the battery, um, I expect, you know, material changes. I expect cost redu or weight reductions coming from the truck builders. Yeah, so I, I would, that's a great, so, um, I, I, you know, I don't know a, a lot about how, you know, uh, loads get brokered and shippers and carriers and all that. What I would say is that, I do think what's going to happen here, the shippers are asking for more sustainability. They're asking for, you know, battery electric trucks where they can, et cetera, et cetera. Right now, they're not helping the carriers with that. Uh, I expect they will. Um, and, and I guess what I'm saying is I think in the future, the shipper carrier relationship uh, is going to change. And um, data, you know, the vast amount of data we have or, or will continue to get will help. Because now, instead of showing up I'm like, oh my God, you know, that load's too heavy for me, I think we're gonna, you know, know more about what, each, what is each tractor weigh, what's each trailer weigh, 
uh, you know, in more finite detail when those loads are brokered. So. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's no free lunch here. I think we're going to see more cooperation um, between shippers and carriers, and then even others um, as as we move into this. That's a good point. Yes, sir. I, I'll, if you can remember your three, give me one at a time. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the first one I have is just I just did quick calculations with your two and a half kilowatt hours, but that looks like like 37 cents a mile. Is that kind of what you're seeing or? On? Like I just Googled the electricity like kilowatt cost. cost and so, then. Well, I think what your question is, is like just cost of operation, right? So the trucks are expensive, um, you know, depending on where we're gonna be paying for diesel pricing and where your utility, price, utility electricity pricing is, um, you know, and how many miles you drive, that's going to be the, the real calculation of what a savings might be to go electric. Those electric costs are going to vary a lot more than the diesel costs are. So, it, you know, there's demand charges, there's, um, you know, different kinds of utility charges that are going to be uh, a challenge for all of us to understand. Was that? Okay. Yeah. And then the second question, I've heard that they were looking at doing, like, as far as weight goes, like weight credits similar to what they do for... Um, having like a, um, what are those little motors? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think we, I, th I think yes. But, um, you know, this industry has had a long history of, uh, you know, length and weight. If we could only haul, you know, two 30 footers, or if we could only haul, you know, a longer trailer or get more weight. Um, and that's very challenging to get through the regulatory process. I mean, it just seems to never happen. So I am concerned um, and there's already, we're already seeing groups, even with heavier cars and heavier pickup trucks, saying, oh my God, you know, what's, what's the safety implications of a much heavier vehicle, not only on uh, safety of the vehicles on the road, but also wear and tear on roads and bridges and so forth. So, um, you know, I think, I think we'll see some logic there, but I don't know that we're going to see a lot of uh, support for heavier okay. weights. And then do you see a lot of like e-axle type setups out there? Because it seems like a lot of these manufacturers are still sticking with a regular axle with like, like International has a, a motor driving a drive shaft, yep. which is a lot less efficient than that's a great like question. Edison uh, motors. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we'll see, um, so you could, you, could put, you could put the motors in the wheels, in the wheel ends. Um, you can have electric axles. You could push the electric motor up into the drivetrain with a transmission and, a, and you know, and drive shafts. I don't think we know yet, you know, all the benefits and, you know, and challenges or consequences of all those different scenarios. I think um, when you get into vocational trucks, might need one sort of architecture, you know, creep modes and backing up and those sort of things. And then some of the highway tractors might get, um, you know, different ones. So um, I think we'll continue to see a bunch of different solutions and then it'll start to settle in over the next five, 10 years. Really good question. Yes, sir. Uh, with the driver, oh, with the drivers that you interviewed who were driving the electric trucks, was there kind of a common theme of what they liked more, or did everybody have yeah. different responses? Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, they're quiet, incredibly quiet. So um, uh, they they notice that quickly. Um, they, you know, they talk about oh my seat, my seat, or my I hear my tires, or so forth. So 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 they're quiet. That's not insignificant. Um, the other thing they talk about is, um, uh, uh, you know, how many times they spill fuel on their pants, on their shoes, and so forth. And there's, you know, there's none of that. Um, if they're bringing the truck back and parking it in a spot overnight and coming back to the next day, which a lot of these early electric trucks are, they talk about how much easier it is to charge. You know, they, they drive back to the depot. They're not waiting in a fueling line. They're not trying to go to a truck stop for fuel. They're coming back, they're moving their car out of the spot, they're plugging in, they're going home. It's like 30 seconds versus whatever to go fuel up. The one for me that blew my, kind of blew my mind was, and it's just, it was a guy I showed, he's a really fit guy. You know, he's like five, six, just incredibly fit, young guy. And he's like, um, I don't feel tired when I go home. I feel great, you know, I'm playing softball again and I'm doing this and, and I'm, I just kept asking him like over and over and over, you know, what causes that? 
because he kept talking about how big it was. And I think we learned together it's the AMT versus this incredibly smooth operation. So when you're going to the dock to the freeway, uh, even in an AMT, I mean, we kind of, we fell in love with AMTs. Um, you know, you don't have a clutch, you don't have a stick shift, so they're great. But what they do is they still rock the driver. There's, it's still, I mean, I don't know about violent, but it's a, it's a, it's a uh, chaotic thing, right? Shifting through all those gears, and I, uh, I really think that that that's one of them. Um, you know, the concerns they have before they get in the truck is uh, high voltage, uh, range. Will they get home? Um, I think the high voltage piece, uh, you know, they, they, you just work with, work with the drivers on education and training. I think getting home is, uh, you know, and range anxiety is a, quite an interesting thing. It's a responsibility of the fleet to put them in a route that's going to get them home. But secondly, it really encourages them to, like I said earlier, to, to, to be efficient, be smart in their driving and get it. So um, I, um, I mean, I'll say this. I think, I think electric trucks has the chance to be the biggest driver attraction and driver retention of anything that I'll ever see in my whole career. Down, down to Amazon vans all the way up to semi-trucks. I, I, I listen to these drivers and just driving them myself, I, I really think. Now, I've got a lot of other things to work on, right? Uh, oh, oh, I mean, you know, but, but I think the driver piece is real, very real. Yes, sir. Uh, the general idea in the industry is that they're trying to shove the electric trucks down our throat. Do you see a shift in the demand? Do carriers actually demand and are looking for electric trucks? Yes. Because we've noticed that electrical vehicle sales have yep. come down. So yep. Is there a demand? Or are we still trying to convince everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. to switch? Yeah, so uh, for any media out there, don't print this. But, uh, you know, I don't know where I am on the whole, you know, shove it down our throat. You know, is, is the government shoving down our throats or not? You know, you got CARB, we've got the EPA. Um, it seems like the regulators love these zero emission trucks and aren't as interested in renewables, renewable natural gases, other things. So I don't know. We'll see on all that. Um, I'm glad you asked the rest of the question because, you know, the, the fleets are starting to see, uh, and again, you can't buy a sleeper electric truck now. These are all day cab, city and medium range trucks. So, um, you know, that's food and beverage, that's drayage. That's, uh, you know, parts of, of, uh, of package, middle mile sort of things. In those places, and I was just with a fleet um, yesterday in uh, Greer, South Carolina, Benor Logistics. I don't know if anybody knows Benor Logistics. They do ma manufacturing shuttles around, um, around the BMW plant. So they go from warehouse, just small little five, six miles here and there, here and there. They do it all day, 24 hours a day, or whatever two drivers can get done, 20, 22 hours a day. And uh, they have seven electric tractors, and they love them. Had some issues on the early one or two, but they're really settling in nicely. And I asked uh, them, you know, if, um, if cost wasn't an issue for them in that little shuttle operation, uh, you know, how many would they buy? And they basically said 50, 60, 70. So they're making it work in their operation. So don't get me wrong. This is not ready for long-haul trucking. It's not ready for long LTL. Um, but, uh, you know, given what we're seeing in, in short day cab use and then, uh, you know, what, how I mentioned some of the performance, like the Tesla Semi and some of the testing things out there, super truck stuff, we'll see, you know, I don't know. Um, yes. <laughs> You're getting your work out. Thank you. In 2050, how do you see the role of an independent truck repair shop? Yeah, so if you didn't hear it, the question is in 2050, what do I think about the uh, independent truck repair shop? Um, well, I think, let me, let me, like, I think in 2050, um, you know, we're still going to be hauling freight. You know, I'm not so much on the automation side, so let's kind of push that aside, but I don't think, I think that's probably germane to your question. Um, you know, I, I think we're going to continue to have technology in these trucks. I think they're continually going to break down. There's going to be things that we design for life, things that we don't. I'm not sure it changes that much. Um, you know, I think that uh, the challenge for the truck OEMs uh, will be uh, how do they figure out how to offer a natural gas engine, a battery electric, a hydrogen, et cetera, um, you know, in, in kind of a common truck, you know, or a common chassis, right? So 
Um, they'll have to figure that out in the next 10 years. Things might settle in a little, like I was suggesting, by 2050. Um, that's a long time away. <laughs> it's coming, though, isn't it? I mean, 2050, uh, you know, I think we will be predominantly battery electric, hydrogen fuel cell, and probably some renewable diesel engines operating. So that's, you know, three kinds of, like, powertrains, even after the messy middle, so to speak. Um, but I think we're still going to, I mean, we're still going to have stuff to fix. And I think there's going to be things that are going to be done by, uh, you know, company shops and, and independents. I, I, I don't, there's certain things that, you know, our industry changes what, but doesn't change, you know, kind of the how. Do you agree with that or disagree or give them the microphone? <laughs> I guess the thought process is that this new technology is going to be proprietary in some way. Are they going to share that information? Yeah, no, I, I think it's still, you know, you know, we've been through the vertical powertrain, you know, integration with, you know, I'm, you know, Daimler axles, Daimler transmissions, Daimler engines, and so forth. Um, and there's some of that, but there's still, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, Cummins and this and that and the other, just to name a few, uh, you know, from tires to, to other pieces. So. And trucking, you know, is so dependent on topography and the use case and you heavy, you light, flatbed, bulk. I mean, it just goes on and on. So I think um, uh, we will still have the proliferation of trucks and, and components that you see like at, a, at, at this show. Um, and, and uh, you know, and you'll have to fix them. You'll have to operate them. you have to do it. I mean, I, uh, you know, at... Uh, uh, a New York dump truck doesn't work in Arizona, and a bulk hauler somewhere. I mean, so we can try to make it work, but I don't. I think that you know, trucking will still be trucking in some of those re regards. Yeah. Could you talk more about the hydrogen uh, technology, especially with what Cummins is going to do with it? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. So I'm going to start. <laughs> I, I I will get here real quick, but. Um, you know, battery electric trucks are going to work in small trucks. So vans, step vans, medium duty box trucks. I think, I think like that's done. That's going to be battery. That's going to move from diesel and gasoline to battery. It'll just take some time. Um, smaller battery packs, you know, slower charging, et cetera. As you get up into what we call small or short, medium and long return to base tractors. So short and medium. I think we're going to be battery electric for the most part. Once you get up into long return to base and long sleeper disparate routes, there we get into a number of challenges. Um, one, uh, you know, you got to have a charging station or something in a lot of places because of the disparate routes of sleeper trucks. Um, two, uh, to get into that, you know, 500, 600 mile battery electric trucks, the batteries do get very big and very heavy. Uh, I, I, uh, we're pretty big on battery electric trucks taking up a lot of that before the need for hydrogen. So the reason hydrogen, you know, a hydrogen fuel cell, the fuel cell is a no moving parts engine that can take hydrogen, turn it into electricity, get it to those same basic motors that you're operating for the battery electric truck and haul freight. Um, and so the hydrogen fuel cell truck, um, that there's some prototypes out there. They're working pretty well. Nikola is in production with one. Um, but their main benefit is the fact that you have much smaller battery pack, much lower weight penalty, and theoretically you can fill the hydrogen tanks up much quicker than you can charging a battery electric truck. There are a few other benefits of hydrogen, um, but those are the key ones. The fact that you don't have as much weight, don't have as much battery, and you can, you can fill it faster. Now the fill time, I'm not so sure. I mean, there's, you know, we got megawatt kind of charging. So that Tesla Semi has got 900 kilowatt. Make, if you can hit that with a megawatt charging, uh, then you're, you're, you're filling up that entire battery pack in about 45 minutes. Uh, not diesel fill time, but you know, you cut that by another third or half. Now you're fast charging an electric truck pretty quickly. So, <laughs> If you're sticking with me, so hydrogen fuel cell, I expect to be part of the solution. Team drivers, disparate routes. Um, now there's a lot of ch struggles with that. You got to get hydrogen to the truck stops. It's likely got to truck it. It's probably got to be liquid. There's 
cost and penalties or cost challenges, et cetera, et cetera. What Cummins and others are working on is, okay, well, if hydrogen's the future, why don't we burn hydrogen in an engine now uh, and be on the path to this hydrogen infrastructure because we're going to need it later, and let's burn it in an engine now. Um, now, uh, I don't have any Cummins folks in the room, but you know they're doing a really good job of, build, of building and working on an engine where the base engine's the same for natural gas, for uh, diesel, for hydrogen, uh, et cetera, uh, with only some changes to the top of the engine. So wouldn't maybe have that big engineering effort to get it into the trucks. Um, I worry that this is just too much. This is too much for all of us to do, right? Yet, all right, like the federal government just put out yesterday, or two days ago, well, last, I don't know, a couple days ago, a strategy for uh, what they felt like the um, electric infrastructure and hydrogen infrastructure would look like over the next 20 years. You know, and some people respond, it's like a trillion dollar investment. Well, you know, that's going to be some private, some public, some of your money, some of my money, if it's public. Um, you know, wow. Uh, so I think that some of these solutions that look good now are going to kind of settle in, and I'm not sure the hydrogen engine will be as big as a lot of people. That's your question. I don't think the hydrogen engine maybe will be as big, but maybe, I don't know. Um, it makes sense because it's on the pathway to this long-term hydrogen fuel cell sleeper truck, but um, a lot of ifs there, right? Like, Yes, Steve. Hi, my uh, question is, why do we blow by uh, uh, hybrid so quick? Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you know, I've been a proponent of that for a long time, have a tag axle that's electrified and, uh, uh, you know, kind of low horsepower, maybe 100 horsepower, just for regenerative braking. And right. I, so. Know, I think you're talking kind of like locomotive-like trucks, so where you've got a smaller engine maybe, and you're using a battery electric, or either in a series hybrid or in a parallel hybrid, but just why, why are we jumping to battery electric from hy hy hybrids? This is a really good question. A um, couple of things that I think through. One, uh, the battery electric truck's pretty simple. You don't have all these moving parts, you don't have an engine, you got you know batteries, power electronics and axle and you, and you, and you haul freight. Um, if you put an engine in there, now you've got the engine that has to pass all the carb and the NOx and the EPA rules. Uh, so the regulators, I don't think, the way they're regulating trucks makes hybrids really tough. Um, I think we'll see some electrified, electrification going on on trucks. I think the new Volvo I just showed, isn't that a 24 or 48 volt system on the brand new truck that they, they really haven't built yet? I think um, we'll start to see some, uh, you know, electrification in some spots, not unlike what you're talking about, um, but I don't know that we'll see like the truck OEMs going full scale, you know, big sort of hybrids because of uh, the regulatory piece as much well, as anything. There was a company, Helion, uh, you know, it was out of Pittsburgh and um, you know, first they wanted to electrify a trailer axle. <laughs> I don't want my trailer pushing me, you know. Uh, but they kind of came around, they were going to do yep. a, a lower horsepower axle in the back, and I was going to be the first truck they were going to do it on. And then uh, the wizard from uh, Omaha bought the company, moved it to Texas, and they expanded to this very complicated, yeah. you know, 350 horsepower, and it's so much heat generated by the batteries, you gotta have air conditioning to cool it. And it gets complicated. All that, you need yeah. is a little bit of horsepower, just, uh, and not that complicated, really. You just take off my tag axle, put an electric axle on there, and some simple controls, yeah. and away yeah. you go. I, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I wouldn't bet against it, but, um, you know, from an OEM doing it, uh, and, and really committed to it. They've got so much going on with all these others that I just wonder if that's going to make the cut, so to speak, uh, even though there's a lot of logic. Great question. Yes, sir. He's coming right back here. Um, 
in the in the examples that you you, you cited of the electric vehicles, um, have you seen anything about like battery life? Is there like decay in battery life? How quickly does that happen? Yep. Is that like two hundred fifty mile range? Is that the advertised range? But your actual range is like yeah eighty percent of that. Uh, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to give you a really shitty answer to start with. Sorry, it's it's five o'clock somewhere, right? Um, uh, I think betting against batteries is a bad idea. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, the proverbial, my cell phone was this big and now it's this big. Uh, you know, I, uh, y y y there's a lot you know, from solid state batteries, et cetera. There's a lot going on with batteries. Um, uh, people bring up, well, what about recycling? We're going to have all these batteries. I mean, I think that stuff was likely going to get resolved. Now, the real answer to your question, batteries don't like cold weather. So for every, right now with these electric trucks, for every 10 degrees F below 40 degrees F, you lose 10% range. You see it in cars, you see it in trucks. Some OEMs are better than others. Some have more advanced battery management systems that don't have that sort of range reduction. Um, you know, some of that battery management system affects the life of the battery too. Uh, we're talking about a lot of cycles here. We're talking about big battery packs. We're talking about, you know, in some cases, um, you know, exercising the whole band of the battery um, because of the challenges or the what we want to do in trucking. So I think we don't know yet uh, on these different chemistries. Uh, the thing I'm learning, I don't want to become a battery expert, but I guess I have to become a, you know, I, I think there's battery chemistries and then there's um, like uh, design uh, uh, nuances to battery systems. And we're starting to see, nuances isn't the right word, but like they're, they're starting to, to really work on cold weather. They're starting to work on cycle life. They're working on this. So um, what we're seeing in passenger cars, we thought that um, passenger cars that were built seven, eight years ago, that the batteries would be crap and they would be needed to be replaced. For the most part, we're hearing in the automotive industry, they're doing better than they thought. Trucks aren't cars. Nobody yell at me. I get trucks aren't cars. But um, I don't know. Well, you know, uh, I, don't, I, I wouldn't bet against batteries. I'll come back to that. Anything else? Again, thanks for sticking around. I know there's a beer in my future, maybe in yours. Um, uh, hang in there. Thanks for coming. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, change coming to us. I get that. I think just be patient. Know your business, like I mentioned, and good luck. Uh, if you want a card, you're right over there. Um, thanks for your time.